we find ourselves at a crossroads of unprecedented challenges and transformative opportunities. Axon is one of those companies that stands as a beacon of innovation and progress. With a comprehensive suite of public safety solutions, Axon is in the forefront of bridging the gap between law enforcement and the communities they serve. Today we're joined by Rick Smith, the CEO of Axon. His story is one of inspiration and determination, sparked by personal tragedy, fueled by a vision to make our world safer. With over two decades of experience, Axon has become synonymous with cutting edge solutions that redefine how we approach public safety. I am Patrick Yeos, National President of Fraternal Order Police. This is the Blue View. Well, Rick, thanks for joining us on the Blue View podcast. Uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, you know, uh, you and I had a very long conversation when we were at our national FOP conference during the expo, and I really enjoyed talking to you about the technology on, on, on the evolution of policing. You know, I'm a 36-year law enforcement officer myself. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen the evolution of where we've gone to where we are today, and uh, it was really refreshing to, to talk about technology not in a way that just makes our jobs easier but makes it safer and uh and talk about what's on the horizon as well so thank you for joining us uh to to talk about technology and policing before we do that let's uh tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself yeah so um my background i studied neurobiology i was a science fiction geek i actually recently found uh my essay that i wrote on my college entrance application uh, was that I wanted to build robotic limbs. I was fascinated by Luke Skywalker's robotic hand and this idea that the human machine could interface with things that we make. Uh, and by the way, it's crazy the world we live in now. Like just in the past couple decades, you know, the number of people with bionic hips and shoulders and knees, like this stuff didn't exist 30 years ago. And yet in today's world, like the economic value of artificial hips is bigger than all of Hollywood combined. These are enormous new industries. I have a board of director who she could barely walk. And now she's running around like she's, you know, 20 again. Uh, she had both hips replaced. So anyways, I started there at, at the intersection of technology and biology. And then when I was in grad school, two of my high school football teammates were shot and killed in a road rage incident. Uh, in a golf resort parking lot in Scottsdale, Arizona. And that just drove home to me this, like the world is unfortunately kind of a violent place and it's not just somewhere else in someone else's neighborhood, it impacts all of us. And the other thing that struck me was the guy who killed my two friends is now spending his life in jail. He was a business consultant who had a gun and a bit of a temper. And I don't think he intended to murder anyone that day. Like life is complicated. Like, you know, when people get in conflicts, rationality can go out the window and and things can spiral out of control. And the other thing that struck me was, how is it that in the year 1990, back then, that the state of the art, the way we defend ourselves is the same way, like the British fought pirates in the Caribbean in like the 1600s, right? We're shooting lead balls at each other. And, you know, science fiction many times the arts can imagine the future before we know how to make it, right? Like rocket ships appeared in books and airplanes before they became reality. Well, you can look at, you know, Captain Kirk didn't shoot bullets at people anymore starting in the 1960s. There was this vision of maybe we could make energy weapons that would do the thing we want, which is to stop someone who might be trying to hurt you and do it in a way that doesn't require taking somebody's life in the process. And so I immediately shifted or shifted my focus away from I had wanted to build machines that the human body and brain could control to instead building machines that can control the human body. And that's basically what a taser is. It uh, uses electricity to lock up your muscles in a way that does not require causing any physical long-term damage. It just paralyzes you temporarily. And by the way, this wasn't my idea. Initially, the original taser inventor was one of the chief scientists on the Apollo project back in the 1960s. uh, And I found him literally through 411, which I now have to explain to many of my younger employees. You have no idea what 411 is because the world has changed. Um, and, uh, and I was 23 at the time and he was 73 and I convinced him, I was like, hey, let's give this thing another shot. Like we need to bring Captain Kirk's phaser to reality and, and you've got the best tech I've seen, this taser weapon dating back to the 70s. And here I am now, 30 years later, uh, where we've, we've got a whole host of different technologies, but the, the thing that, and, and it really, uh, what you said to me earlier was, was really uh, 
appreciated in a heartfelt sense when you said that, uh, you know, you didn't feel like I was trying to sell you anything and that it was really about the technology. I do get really excited. I think when we solve problems with technology, it is durable in a way like once mankind determined how to make clean water, the world, you know, most of the world never went back. Right. We now all drink right. clean water, indoor plumbing, and you just keep going down take the list. Take it for granted. Take it for you, granted. Yeah, you take it for granted. Now we fly in these aluminum tubes at 600 miles an hour and we can be on the opposite side of the earth in 12 hours. Like that is they're magical. not delayed. <laughs> if they're not delayed. <laughs> and then we get focused on, ah, uh, you know, the, they weren't serving, you know, my favorite meal or the flight was two hours late. And we kind of, we take it so for granted. It's like yeah. this magical thing happened. And even though it was some minor tweak, it, it could have been better. Um, and I just try to maintain that sense of, you know, wide eyed uh, appreciation for the amazing things that are changing the way we live every day. You know, I wrote a story one time. Uh, 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 it was an article in a magazine, and I, I needed to talk about technology, how it evolved. And I used my grandfather uh, as an example of uh, him watching uh, two brothers in Baton Rouge, uh, the Ryan brothers, fly this uh, contraction and uh, crash it inside of a barn. And, uh, and in a, you know, fast forward to where we are, you know, in his later years, uh, to things that we take for granted today. They all started. They all started with uh, with the passion of someone uh, you know, in innovation and bringing us to where we are. And I liken that to law enforcement. You know, when I started in 1984 and pinned on a badge and went to work every day, uh, look at by the time I left 36 years later, uh, how everything has evolved. And, and that evolution in those 36 years is nothing compared to probably what we're seeing in the last 10. Uh, it, it really is exciting in a lot of ways to see the, how how technology. I know when I first started, you know, thirty nine five radio, you know, which if, if we were walking over each other. To now we have seamless communications. It's just what an evolution. And so I really want to talk about tech technology. But you touched on something, and I think it's important. We all have things that uh, that drive us. Uh, you know, sort of a defining moment in our life. And you mentioned that you lost two friends, uh, and you watched it unfold. And uh, that is a little bit of your inspiration, isn't it, of, of finding Taser to find some solution to have less than lethal approach? Um, yeah. Can you talk it, a little it, bit about ultimately, that? Ultimately, it, it, it strikes me as bizarre that technology has changed everything about the way we live. Even in my lifetime, it has changed so much. Yet, for some reason, the area of how we defend ourselves, interpersonal self-defense, is, has not changed very much in a few hundred years. Yes, we've gone from muzzle loaders to revolvers to semi-automatic pistols, but compare that to what happened in transportation. We went from horses to airplanes and rocket ships. Medicine, we went from Any, leeches yeah. and like amputating limbs, you know, with a swig of alcohol to now personalized genetics. Uh, I think this is an area where tech could make a huge difference because ultimately, like, look, when especially for police officers. When they use lethal force, they never use it because it's lethal. They use it because it's reliable. And it has this horrible side effect that, oh, yeah, it, it actually kills someone, that that's the only way you can stop them effectively. That is a solvable problem uh, in my estimation. And, and by the way, we've solved it in the lab. We have in the laboratory, if I hook you up to a, a, a modern taser weapon, you're done. You will not be able to respond. But out in the real world, people don't hold still. We don't get to put the two darts on them. We've got to get the probes through the clothing. There's engineering challenges ahead of us, and we're working hard on those. But this doesn't require any black magic or voodoo or things that require a fundamental change in the physics of the universe. We can get to a point. We, we're just working on the delivery systems. How do we get these neurological effects to 100% reliable delivery uh, in the next couple of decades? You know, I, I, some people think that law enforcement officers are all out there. We all carry guns and, you know, Wild West, uh, you know. But, but in reality, when, when a law enforcement officer has to use uh, deadly force, lives change. And it's not just the, uh, you know, on both sides of this issue, law enforcement officers' lives change as well. So the, the, that avenue, the ability to be able to de-escalate uh, things that are, that are on that, that, that you know, force continuum, uh, those less than lethal approaches are, are so important uh, but, I, and I'd like to, for you to, to, you know, we talked about how technology's changed, uh, you know, in my 36 years, you know, you've been doing this since 1993. 
I look at where we were in 1993 when, when they were talking about tasers. I kind of was a little skeptical at first because I was, you know, just uh, you know, brought up in a different era. And then I recognized the impact that it had. And But but it's not just tasers. Let's talk about that evolution. In 1993, uh, I want to talk about what's on the future. Before we can talk about the future, I need to, to, to talk about what was the future in 1993. And where we, where we get today and how it has evolved. And then we'll open the door to, to what we have uh, coming on the horizon. Well, the, the thing that is to me super exciting about the public safety space is not the progress we've made, but what is potential still. There's so much opportunity. Like, for example, when I was born in 1970, the state of the art of how people communicated was a rotary dial telephone. You remember these. Great. You can't even find those anymore. You have to go to a museum to find them. And in the 1970s, police were basically using push-to-talk radios. Now, as I stand here today, yes, there's some things have changed, but fundamentally, the way we uh, communicate as consumers is just dramatically different. We do, like you and I are doing right now, is, you know, video conferencing, whether it's via Zoom or Facebook or any of a number of different platforms. We have these very social media platforms that allow us to you know, share memories and, and to share experiences in real time or uh, in storylines. Uh, so I see, yes, we've made some progress. There have been a number of things that have changed. I think the, you know, the taser has, has gone from zero to pretty ubiquitous. Body cameras, you know, 10 years ago, nobody had them. And now they're becoming standard issue equipment. Uh, the connection of cloud software into policing, I think, is probably the most important for accelerating the future. Uh, because that was a shift. Like when, when Apple invented the iPod, the last thing the world needed was another MP3 player. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of music players, but they were really hard to use because you, like, you had to go like get some pirating software, download on some shady website, and then getting the music industry actually didn't want you to take the music off their CDs and put it on your MP3 player. So you had to almost break copyright laws. Well, you did. You had to break the copyright laws to get the music on your player. Uh, and then Apple sort of connected this all together with the iTunes store in the cloud. And now music companies don't even make CDs anymore. We just we download it over the Internet and we move at the speed of now. And like technology shifts, you know, chat GPT is one of the latest to think about this new artificial intelligence software. Well, forget what it does. One of the most impressive things about it, chat GPT with the worst branding name in history. Like <laughs> it is not Coca-Cola or, you know, McDonald's chat GPT. That technology went from zero to 100 million users in something like 30 days. Like that would have been impossible in the old AOL world of mailing people disks and da da da. So anyway, you know, we've seen these changes in the last 30 years, but I think the next 30 years are going to be mind blowing because now that law enforcement is sort of connecting into the technology providers, whether it's us or any any of the other tech companies that service policing, we're going to see this acceleration where new capabilities are coming out much, much faster than in the past decades. You know, it's, it's funny you bring up uh, iPods. Um, I actually, uh, yesterday, was going through some stuff and found my iPod. And, and I could looked at it. I kind of held it for a minute saying, man, my, how the world has changed <laughs> just uh, just in that brief period of time. And, uh, yeah. And, it, remember, and then the change when your iPod suddenly became a phone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and in cameras, everybody got everybody has a camera. <laughs> Yeah. So just the, the, whole, the entire evolution of that, you know, uh, you know, as somebody who who watched a uh, taser grow into to what it is, it's much more than just uh, uh, just less than lethal. Uh, you've got a whole a whole uh, suite of of uh, opportunities for law enforcement officers to be much more professional, much more efficient. Um, let's talk about where we are today, uh, that evolution that brought you. What's uh, the things that are today? And then, then we'll talk about what's on the horizon. Yeah, so uh, we started with the taser weapon, and then we got into the we, – we actually created the body camera space largely because when taser was finally successful in the early 2000s, it became so controversial. Like, you, you may remember this. Like, there were headlines. I do, I do remember. Yeah. You know, everybody was saying, oh, the police are torturing me. They're doing all these horrible things. I actually sat at a defense table in Northern California with two officers – uh, defending a case, this was a guy who died in police custody. And look, it was pretty clear he died from methamphetamines, long history of abuse. There was a delay between the taser strike, et cetera. But the point was the story the family was telling was so different than what the officers told me they saw. 
And I remember sitting there like, if you're a juror, what do you do? You just have to choose, like, do I believe the cops or do I believe this family that's telling me this very emotional story? And the other thing I learned was police, you don't get to tell stories. You don't get to be emotional. You have to be precise, right? If somebody in the public tells a lie, no, it's not a big deal. There's no repercussion. Officer gets caught in a lie once. That could be the end of their career. Uh, big implications for the agency. So what happens, you get the family that comes in and they're telling this very emotional story. These police officers were these jackbooted thugs doing these terrible things, all this color and emotional power. And then the officers would get on the stand and they'd say, well, you know, Mr. H in this case was doing X, Y, and Z. And they're very clinical and precise because they have to be. And it was in that moment uh, during that week when I was co-defending that case with these officers, he said, look, we got to record what you guys are saying. Like, you are at such a disadvantage to the emotion and the freedom to embellish that other people who accuse you of things have. You don't get that. You, you're an agent of a government agency that's highly constrained to be very precise and non-emotional. We need to show the world what you're saying. And that was the birth of the body camera. Uh, and then the body camera, we quickly realized, would never spread because agencies would have no way to manage all the data. Uh, and that's where we took some inspiration from Apple. We basically said, look, what made the Apple iPod great wasn't the piece of hardware. It was the hardware software ecosystem where the challenge on your music player is how do I get all my songs onto my device? For police with body cameras, the question would be how do I get all my videos off my device somewhere safe with good security? And then I've got to be able to share with my sergeant and the prosecutor and all that yeah yeah and secure uh without a doubt and it has certainly changed it's changed policing uh uh, uh, you know there are courts now that say if they don't there's not video it didn't happen well i mean i I don't i don't quite i can't wrap my head around that it doesn't mean a crime didn't occur uh it's just uh the courts are leaning so much now on video uh uh, video evidence that uh that that it kind of overshadows some of the things that were old school you know police work It does. You know, but one sign of success to me is the critics who 15 years ago were saying every cop's got to wear a camera because we've got to find all these bad cops. Now they're saying, well, I don't know if we should keep these body cameras because they're not really finding bad cops. The cops are now using it to prosecute the the public. Rick, I'm going to tell you what they're doing. You know what? You know what? Look, this is anytime there's a human element is always going to be uncertainty. Anytime there's an escalation or a lack of a uh, lack to com- you know not complying with uh, with lawful orders. There's always going to be an escalation. Um, but what you're going to find, and and I've said it all along. You know, I remember you know when 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 video cameras, you know when when body cameras came out at first. You know, I remember telling people, look, we're not that far away from everybody having a camera on it. And I remember officers scratching their head saying, I don't see it. It was too futuristic for it to happen. And then we were just a few years later. You know, having them. It's not so much the camera. It's as you say. It's the uh, the problem is more the archiving and the uh, the accessibility of the files and how do you you know how do you you know manage all of that. But all that aside, um, you know, the reality is is we find ourselves now in in a, in a completely different space where body cameras are important because, as you said, and a lot of people thought it was going to show cops that were not doing a good job. What it's showing is law enforcement officers doing an amazing job under very stressful situations and and more often than not you're finding that's what you're finding as opposed to the you know the rarity of of, of you know things that are you know just you know not justifiable um, yeah the reality yeah. where we are yeah and and for me that's been just tremendous justification uh i remember hearing those officers and thinking back you know 15 years ago in that situation they were called by a family that was under assault from their 40 year old son who had a severe drug problem, that it was an unwinnable situation. Um, and they were being accused of all sorts of, frankly, it was so dramatic. You could, I, I didn't believe, you know, what, what was being said against them, but there was no way to disprove it. And I think that's one of the things I'm most proud about body cameras is it has come out and shown. Yeah. I mean, officers are doing a thankless job in unwinnable environments every day and they do amazing work. And look, every now and then somebody, somebody loses it. They crack under the pressure or like, you know, a human element There's a human element. It's all what you're always going to have. It doesn't matter to profession. We just, you know, uh, police are the the people to pick on nowadays. So uh, we tend to get it. We're called to, to, to manage all of these conflicts in people's lives. And, 
you know, in a lot of cases, you got you need somebody to blame. And uh, law enforcement has always, always been on the receiving end uh, of all of that. But that's uh, just a strange world we live in. You know, you 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 mentioned you were you know sitting there in a situation where uh, where officers were responding to a home of a uh, call by the family because their son, hey, whether they had substance abuse or a mental illness, whatever it is, um, you know, we're, we're called to referee through those things. And, and unfortunately, that very scenario plays out every single day over and over and over uh, in Amer- across America and, and puts law enforcement and families in a, in a very difficult situation. Hence, uh, it goes back to the less than lethal and the opportunities to be able to uh, to try and defuse some of these things. But that is probably one of the greatest challenges for law enforcement today. Um, you know, dealing with uh, with with people who are either uh, mental illness or substance abuse, and and having to to you know, you never know where they're going to escalate to the point where it's it's it could be deadly, and you could almost hear the frustration in families. Um, you know, families calling for some help. They they just can't live like that, and yet yet we show up and find ourselves in the same situation and, you know, over and over and over. It's a challenge for law enforcement. So, uh, and, and body camera, less than lethal, all of these things have been some, some great uh, tools to, to help us manage through that. Well, um, you, you asked about the, the state of the tech today. There's one other big piece I'd want to share that, uh, for me, this is a learning journey. With each new piece of technology, you uncover new opportunities and new, new problems. Uh, and so for us, like once we, we built this digital evidence management system that could handle all these video files. Then the next question is, well, what valuable information is hidden away in those videos? Because those videos are no longer on a disc or on a VHS tape in a warehouse. It's on a computer. And we could do something with that. Uh, and so about five years ago, we, well, maybe seven years ago now, we started investing pretty heavily in a record management system. And the thesis was really simple. Um, I spent a lot of my time talking to cops. And then I spend a fair amount of my time going to conferences on technology trends and evolution. And AI has been big on people's minds for the past decade. And the takeaway I had was, look, some point in the next 10, 15 years, an artificial intelligence computer program could take a body camera video and write a police officer's report, at least the first draft for them based on all the information. Like you could take your body camera video, give it to a secretary and he could write it. A computer should be able to do that at some point. Um, so that's the whole reason we got into records management, not because we wanted to build an RMS system, but we felt if we could extract the record from the body camera, it'd be hugely valuable because cops tell me they spend between a third and half of their day, half of their shift as data entry clerks. They sit there hunting and pecking, typing up reports. Uh, no doubt. It's, it's actually really exciting right now because our, our record management system, even just as a cloud-based RMS, uh, I think we're in four or five major cities out of the you know, 60-ish major cities and growing. But we haven't even done the piece yet that's going to make it so exciting, which is to take your body camera and extract the first draft of the report. Uh, but that's something that we're prototyping right now. And with some of the new, you know, this chat GPT, artificial intelligence has had a wild year. The capabilities are just mind-blowing. And that's unlocking the potential that we saw it's just coming in actually faster than we thought it would even get here. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. You know, um, so I, I do. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk about, but I also want to. I recently had the opportunity to uh, to go through some of the training, uh, the virtual training that you have. Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, we we talk about we're talking about these products, but we're also talking about what how to you know how do we train officers to be better officers with this technology? And you've got a great platform for that. Yeah. So I would first take a step back and say, you know, we we look at our military and, you know, we we look at the difficult job they do, but they have this one key advantage. The military generally trains 95 percent of the time and they're doing missions five percent of the time. It's the other way around with law enforcement. (laughs) It's the reverse, right? Like you maybe get five percent of your time for training and 95 percent to do the mission. And oh, by the way, the mission isn't as, you know, I don't want to say as simple, but as clear as it can be with a military, you know, doing military operations, you're in your hometown dealing with everything from domestic arguments. Like these are your friends and neighbors. Uh, it's, it's much more complex, I would say, than warfare and they get a lot less training. So uh, again, we tend to look, my job is to kind of look at what's happening in interesting tech spaces, talk to police leaders, talk to 
frontline officers, trainers, and association leaders and try to identify, okay, what are the big problems that map onto tech? And so one of the more recent ones was virtual reality. You know, these VR headsets create real opportunities to do large scale, low cost, repetitive, uh, you know, where training doesn't mean going into a classroom and sitting and falling asleep during a PowerPoint. Could we put people into immersive experiences where we could put them through and get just tons of reps dealing with highly complex situations to make sure they know how to use their taser effectively. I'll, I'll tell you, like, we're really proud of the tasers we make, but we know the cartridges are expensive. And if an officer only gets to fire one or two cartridges a year compared to the thousands of bullets they fire, they're just going to be more comfortable and more proficient with their gun than they could ever be with a taser. Well, now we're, we're basically building it like, hey, you can fire a few thousand rounds in VR and there's zero marginal cost, we can help get you to that same level of proficiency in the new tech that's, you know, that's just not as cheap to train with in the old world. So I, I'm really excited, whoops, sorry, about what's coming in the next, uh, uh, so excited I almost knocked my screen over here, uh, in, in the next couple of uh, years here. Yeah. You know, I want to I want to talk about uh, so the... Uh, uh, the goal of Axon and working towards reducing gun related uh, deaths uh, involving police in the public by 50% in the next 10 years. I, I want to talk about, uh, about that collaboration and, and a little bit of the goal uh, of what Moonshot, what Moonshot is and what the goal is. Yeah. So um, part of this is to try to focus the public conversation. Well, we meet in an hour of change and challenge in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. some say the moon. Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. So every time we bring out a new taser weapon or something, uh, look, there's a lot of naysayers out there. And there's people who say, well, you know, I don't trust the police. You know, they're, they're just going to abuse somebody with this technology or torture them or do some horrible thing. And what we're trying to say, look, you know, there's always going to be edge cases in humanity where there's, you know, some some bad thing happens. But fundamentally, let's focus on. What is the what what is the big problem we're trying to solve here? And for us, it has been we're trying to find alternatives to shooting people. Now, to do that, we're going to have to make taser weapons that are more aggressive. 
We're going to have to extend the range. We're going to have to give you more shots. So before we launched Taser 10, we, we were working on a 10-shot, semi-automatic, magazine-fed, long-range Taser. Now, to the critic, they can look at that and say, well, why would we give you know, police this? Because I've seen instances where I think they've been abusive with a one-shot Taser. Why should they get 10 shots? And the answer is very simple. Yeah, because sometimes you miss, and when you miss, it escalates, and people get shot and killed. So the reason to give an officer more shots is to give them more attempts to save a life. So this whole moonshot was really to try to focus the conversation rather than, hey, rather than imagining the few things that might go wrong, what is the big problem that we believe is worth solving? And across the board, whether you are a member of Black Lives Matter or a police association or you know, wherever you lie on that spectrum, we found people pretty universally agree, yeah, this would be a good idea if we could reduce the number of people who lose their lives, including cops that are shot and killed and members of the public that ultimately end up on the receiving end of lethal force. Yeah. And so yeah. now that we maintain that conversation and say, okay, now let's, yes, there's going to be things that could go wrong, but let's first talk about what could go right. What if we could bring this number down? What would we have to do? Well, we've got to make the alternatives to a gun more capable. We've got to make them more reliable. And ultimately, we're setting the stage as well. We've talked about drones and robotics. If I want to make a situation, so look, today, if you've got a high-risk warrant, Part of what we may be doing is sending police officers through the door into the unknown, into a high-risk environment. And, of course, they're human beings. They're surging with fear and adrenaline themselves, and they've got lethal weapons to protect themselves against. They don't know what they're going to come up against. That is a recipe for unpredictable things to happen. There's a lot of, uh, of a, like emotion and fear and deadly weapons coming in close contact. I believe in the next decade, one of the biggest things we'll do to save lives on both sides is to say, look, if we have a really high risk situation, we shouldn't have to send our sons and daughters in there. We should send in a drone or a robot. And with that, that gives the police officers time and distance and safety. We're no longer saying, hey, you have to put your life right on the line to go in and deal with this threat. Let's go in and assess it first with a remotely operated system where you're safe and look, it's probably going to make the member of the public safer as well, because the, the space for things to go wrong when everybody's less uh, ha has to be less afraid for their own personal safety means we can be more methodical, take our time. Uh, now, you probably saw when we talked about taser capable drones last summer, you know, the Twitter sphere kind of lost its mind about all the terrible things that could happen. But nobody's given me a better answer. It's like, okay, you got a mass shooter. You got a person with a gun in a mall or a school. The way we stop them today is we send in our sons and daughters in law enforcement, putting their own lives at risk and have a gunfight. I believe we could have drones and robots that could be there faster at much lower risk to everybody involved. Uh, and that's where this moonshot conversation tries to bring us back from like the fringe cases of what could go wrong to we don't have to build a perfect world. We just have to give options that are better than the limited options we have today. Yeah. Uh, so, and what an evolution uh, yeah, uh, from where we were to where we are today and, and how things are changing so quick. Rick, talk uh, and, and, and thank you. I, I love, I love the passion of finding solutions to, you know, you know, often we just kind of get used to the way things are. You're, you're constantly asking the question, how can we improve on it? And, uh, and I think that, that makes, that makes our communities, it makes our jobs uh, a lot safer. Let's look in that window now. Uh, you know, you're talking about what you want to accomplish in the next 10 years with Moonshot, but, uh, my experience is, is the evolution of, uh, of technology in law enforcement is, is at a much greater pace than 10 years. Uh, yeah. things, things are they're, they're you know, it might've, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely on an escalated path. Tell me what you see through that window of, uh, of policing and, 10, 20 years from now? Well, you know, uh, the reason we chose this term moonshot, right? You think back to 1961 when yes. President Kennedy stood out at Rice University and said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth within a decade. That was on the border of crazy uh, in terms of its audacity. It was the greatest, you know, human endeavor in history, but it was possible, right? It was a, it was a combination of imagination and technology uh, you know, there were a lot of smart people knew, who knew it could be possible, but it would just require tremendous effort. And it was by no means a slam dunk. 
as we look at the gun violence problem, look, we, we're not in a position to solve it society wide at this point, but we do believe as we dug in and we defined what is the biggest impact we believe we could have in 10 years, we believe police public interactions are a place where we could take this trend where, look, deaths are going up a little every year. We have the, sh- the chance to cut it in half, but we're going to have to do things differently. And that means we're going to have to open the minds of both police officers to new tools and tactics, but probably even more importantly, open the public to like, hey, we need to give our police agencies some room to innovate here. If we want different outcomes, you can't just keep doing the same thing and then criticizing. We need room to innovate and experiment and try new things and, and measure what's going to move the ball uh, in the right direction. So like, one of the things we did is we partnered with IIR, the Institute for Intergovernmental Research, to create a national database on police uh, shootings, officer-involved shootings. Now, today, if you want that data, you have to go to the Washington Post. And no offense to the Washington Post, but news outlets, their job is to, they sell controversy. And again, I'm not trying to poke at anybody here, but frankly, you know, the Washington Post is competing with everybody on the internet for eyeballs. And so inherently, if they're the only ones really tracking officer-involved shootings, we're probably going to get things that tend to be more controversial than maybe the scientific basis that we could look at to understand the underlying dynamics of what we could do to bring the numbers down. So, I mean, this is all part of this. This moonshot is kind of focused us not only on the tech piece, but how do we get better information and data? And then how do we bring the public along so that if I look 20 years out, I would tell you, I think in 20 years, it's going to be very rare we're sending a police officer through the door into a situation where there's believed to be risk, that that will be something we handle very differently. And, you know, yes, it's a little weird to think about today because we've all seen the Terminator movies. But look, if it's my house and for whatever reason, maybe they've got the wrong address, mistakes happen. And they think that there's a violent felon in my house that has to be arrested. Please send the robot or the drone into my house, not a bunch of human beings who are naturally afraid for their own safety and with legal weapons because they have to have them to protect themselves. So these are the sort of thought experiments we go through. And then the last piece I would say is we also understand there are legitimate concerns about how things could be misused. So we can't just go build, you know, new robots with weapons on them and throw them out into the wild and see what happens. We also do need to put a lot of thought into what sort of oversight mechanisms should police agencies have in place? Uh, what sort of transparency with the public? How do we address those concerns uh, so that we can bring the public along and not end up in a situation where, you know, we get political backlash and then we get locked out of our ability to innovate together? Yeah, as, uh, two, two things here I'd like to, to just uh, respond back on. First one is the very powers we have as police officers are directly related to trust in the community. That transparency piece, that part of, of having the public understand why these are so very necessary to make our jobs at a community safer is worth every penny that's invested in that portion of it. Uh, otherwise, we, we're, we're defeating our, our purpose here. The second one is, is, is uh, I just need to, to point out, I mean, you're talking about innovative ways to make our, our jobs at community safer. Let, let me just tell, tell you the reality of it. Um, the Fraternal Order Police for years has been keeping records of the amount of law enforcement officers are shot in the line of duty. Uh, that data was not collected anywhere by anyone else. Uh, we were able to go to the Department of Justice, say this needs to be done, able to get a grant for it, and started collecting this data. And uh, since we started collecting this data, the, the numbers have been astounding. Uh, we're seeing an escalation in violence towards law enforcement. Every year we're setting a record on the amount of officers that are assaulted. Uh, I guess a, even a more disturbing uh, trend is how many officers are ambushed. Uh, that number is growing existential. Uh, because of the threats that we have, uh, to, you know, to our profession. Um, and so, so the work that you do is so vitally important to this because we see this trend going up. And the only way we're going to get past this is if we find ways to do things in a, a better, more efficient, and a safer way uh, for both, both the officers and, and the public alike. It's the work you're yeah. doing. So, so thank well, you for I, what you do. What the FOP is doing there as well. Like when I mentioned the Institute for Intergovernmental Research, you know, sort of replicating what the Washington Post did. We know they're working with you as well because you guys are on the leading edge on the other side, which is tracking data about police officers that are shot and killed. Because, look, as we looked at this, uh, if we could cut officer-involved shootings 
but more cops got shot because they were taking too much risk, that is a terrible outcome. And so we really are trying to focus on both sides of the equation. How do we keep cops safer? And how do we give them other options so that we can reduce the frequency that they have to escalate to lethal force? Absolutely. Rick, thank you for all that you do. I'll give you a chance. I'll wrap this up. Give you a chance to, to give some, some parting thoughts uh, on, uh, on, on where we are today in, in, in technology. And, and, uh... Well, the first thing I would say is I continue to be just incredibly impressed by the men and women who go into police work. I don't know that I could do the job. I, I do ride-alongs. You know, we have our, our new employees do ride-alongs. We have our board members do ride-alongs. And it is just shocking when you realize how selfless this job is for a police officer to strap on body armor, get into a car and go out into a community knowing they're going to deal in the most dangerous places with the people that the rest of us cross the street to avoid. And yet you have to go and deal with them when they're, you know, in an infinite number of situations that could be incredibly dangerous. And the quality of people who go into this profession just blows my mind. It is definitely a mission driven area that attracts people uh, who are not in it. You're clearly for the money or for the fame uh, and who are willing to take all of the negative risks that come with this in order to create a society that can thrive and prosper and send our kids to school. And so I've got the easiest job in the world by comparison. I get to work in a lab and meet with these incredible officers and then, you know, I get to be the Q to your James Bond or maybe the Alfred to your Batman, where we get to go work on the tech. But then ultimately, you know, it's the men and women of law enforcement. We have to go out, climb into the rocket ship and take the risk uh, of going out into a dangerous world and putting this stuff to use. Yeah, as some 800,000 law enforcement officers every day that make a conscious decision or stay in that line between order and chaos and, and do so recognizing uh, that uh, that it could cost them their own lives or their own their own well-being. Uh, you know, nobody signed up for this profession uh, because they wanted to experience the worst in humanity. Uh, no one signed up for this job because they wanted the, uh, you know, to to live with the the, the things that, uh, that 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 run through their mind at night from things that they've seen. And nobody signed up for this for long hours and and low pay and uh, all of this. It, it truly is a servant heart. And so I, I thank you for, for recognizing that. And I thank you for all that you do to, to try and make our jobs uh, safer and our community safer. Well, right, thank just, you. Thank you. Keep that passion. To be part of the team. Yeah, keep, keep that passion. Uh, keep that passion. Cause I love talking to you talking about how we, we take, take problems. And I think a lot of people focus on problems. They don't focus as much on solutions. And that's, uh, that's exactly what, what, what you're doing. Keep up the great work. Uh, to our, our, our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in to the Blue View Podcast, where we talk about the issues that are so vitally important to the men and women who suit up and show up every single day in communities across this country and make your community safe. Thank you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. To get the latest from the National FOP, make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at GLFOP and on Instagram at FOP National. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.